Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last class we have seen two mid 18th century versions of the natural order thesis. We have seen the physiocrats and we have seen the Italians too. We shall proceed to do Adam Smith today. Adam Smith as you know was a Scotsman and it is known that they followed the Scottish English tradition of looking at natural order. We did not know for instance when we were talking about Kine, what was the role of divine sanction in his conception of natural order. It is a rational system which is conceived as self being self contained, self reproducing and so forth, but which did have a role for the state to perform and which did rest on different social classes of people, the farmers, the distributary class or the landlord and le class terrile. In the Scottish tradition, they believed in the spontaneous ability of the system to follow its own order in which most important the monad or the key agent was the individual as opposed to the social class in the physiocratic system. In Smith's system natural order was pretty much the same as what he called the invisible hand, which was the hand of the market as an institution in which a large number of independent, egocentric individuals participated. It carried forward the physiocratic impulse of identifying a spontaneous force which regulated and organized the economic process. But in the case of Smith, as you will see, there was a huge step forward in more than one direction. Most important, we will remove a common misconception which predominates modern economic thinking about Smith's idea of what the human being was. Modern economic thinking believed that Smith was the founder of a creed in economics which assumed that man was only self-centered and egocentric and very rational and the equilibrium conditions that emerge and evolve in this kind of behavior were the natural order in the sense that it is self centered egocentric behavior which was at the heart of it. We will take a little bit of time to see that Smith had a lot of other things also as drives which lay behind human conduct. For example, in the theory of moral sentiments which is a book which he wrote before the wealth of nations, Smith is very clear about trying to understand the many faceted nature of the human being. If you try to compile a list of drives which pushed the human conduct along different directions, you will find there are several of them, some of them altruistic relating to finding satisfaction in the well-being of others and some of them egocentric finding satisfaction in the well-being of only oneself, but it is a combination of several altruistic and egocentric 
drives. Put together, Smith calls them moral sentiments. What are all the different moral sentiments that you can identify in Smith's writing about human beings? The first one which you can clearly find out is benevolence, that people do receive satisfaction in giving, in making other people happy through gestures of giving and offering. So, that is benevolence, that is definitely there in Smith's writing. Then you have sympathy. Smith feels slightly differently about sympathy as we do today. We have a word today called empathy, do not we? What is empathy? Absolutely. Smith meant by sympathy what we mean by empathy. So, this was a very pronounced drive, the drive, empathetic drive. Then the desire to be praised, flattered, the desire to be told a good boy, that too is a part of Smithian moral sentiment list of them. Then there is a propensity also in the man in Smith's writings of self appraisal. He is evaluating himself both in terms of his altruistic being and in terms of his egocentric being. The self appraisal reflexive aspect of the human personality as it is called today is very much a part of Smith's set of drives. And the next one is a very important, very central thing which we shall come back to again at the end of this list. It is a desire to be an impartial spectator to oneself. It is a kind of social consciousness. It is a kind of introspective view of looking at oneself in the milieu that one is in the society and see where one is in relation to all the drives which is driving oneself. It is a kind of a self evaluative, self appraising perspective rather than thought. Then of course, there is this very central drive which is part of Smith, the drive to constantly improve yourself. The Smith's human being is never satisfied with whatever he has and wherever he is. He always like to be a bit, a bit better off than what he is now. Then he always likes to be praised and to be told that he is doing well, he is a good man, he is a virtuous person. In other, in other words, he likes approbation. Of course, Smith's individual is also a person full of pride who says he does not have an ego. He has an ego and that ego is constantly accompanied by pride. The Smith's individual also has love of power. He likes to dominate others, which is different from the love of being better off. The love of earning more money is different from the love of power. Then he has a sense of honor. He does not like for his loss of face in society. He has a sense of virtue, not so much that he is virtuous or non-virtuous, but he has a sense of virtue in the sense that he likes to acknowledge himself as a virtuous person. Then a love of liberty, fundamentally he does not like to be told what to do and where to go and how. Combined with all these things, there is also a streak of the sly in Smith's man. He likes to get by as best as he can, if possible by cutting corners. So, there is an opportunism in Smith's man too. And finally, not finally, a propensity to avoid work, the laggard, a bit of laziness, a bit of trying to get well off without trying to work much, all that is also there. So, you can see the number of drives which is pushing Smith's man around. He is not a simple egocentric machine. He is not a rational egocentric machine calculating what is in it for me each time. No, there are lots of times when Smith's man relegates himself to a secondary position. Sometimes he relegates the society to such a secondary position that he becomes an opportunist. It is a combination of things. Smith's man is as complex as today's individual is. So, it is this combination of complex drives 
which creates the activity of individual in society and in the economy. And this leads to different modes of behavior. Since egocentrism is primarily at the heart of most of Smith's drives, Smith's man is basically competitive. It is basically a competitive man, but he would like to have his competition within certain rules and norms, because he is also benevolent, because he has also got a sense of charity, he has also got a bit of altruism in him, he has got a sense of virtue in him. In other words, there is a certain measure of accountability of himself to others, which Smith's man would guarantee. So, there is competitiveness, but then there are a whole lot of rules and norms and laws which are evolved in Smithian society, which regulate the competitive behavior within what might be called norms. Any question on this? Yes. This complex <coughs> being called man. Uh, still, why does modern economics treat individual as a profit or utility maximizing? I will be coming to that towards the end of the class. It's a disorder in Smith, which I think is uh, thanks mainly to Bentham and his followers in the utilitarian school of thought. We'll come to that. Uh, Smith is none of. Uh, this straight jacketed uh, thinkers, he is he's, he's, he's not a man who propounded some kind of a robo, no, his man was pretty much like ours. If you look at, uh, if you read as you have read Smith in the original, you find that most of what he says is good common sense, almost everything that he says is good common sense, that is at the heart of Smithian thinking, that is the vitality of the thinking of Smith. And the originality comes exceptionally well because of this common sense. He was not trying to theorize, he was not trying to idealize, he was just, in, just trying to look at the world as it is, he was trying to look at the man as he saw him in the society and then he tried to see what is the meaning of progress in this. Hmm. Okay, so, people compete with each other. People also cooperate with each other, people also collaborate with each other in this business of participating in economic process. The competitive part is highlighted today. A lot of non-competitive behavior is relegated in modern economics to exceptional behavior like in the formation of an oligopoly or in the formation of a monopsony and so forth all of which Smith, Smith was very clear to argue was exceptional and sometimes not very forgivable behavior too. <coughs> now, what is crucial in this complex of drives is the impartial observer. It is a kind of an internal judge an internal referee who is looking at himself and every person has in him this impartial observer. It is this impartial observer who suggests the rules of the game as it were, who draws the limits to what can be done and what cannot be done. It is this impartial observer who is behind all the laws of the society and all the norms of conduct that evolve through time. So, in the Smithian system, the free competitive market and the invisible hand that it is supposed to represent work beautifully as long as the impartial observer in the individual is working well. So, when the impartial observer gets weak, which means if the human being is overcome by greed or slyness, there 
come about aberrations in the system where Smith is the first one to condemn and secondly he is the one who suggests that these are areas where the state should come in and make sure that there are laws which prevent this kind of a behavior. There are times when the impartial observer is so weak and the opportune behavior of people is so dominant that they lead to that people behave in manners which suggest graft, corruption, bribery. Smith is very quick to point these out and says this is not what is meant by the power of an invisible hand. So, what Smith is talking about is a regulated freedom. Laissez faire, yes, but laissez faire subject to the rules and norms and governance of the impartial observer. It is not a world of lawlessness, it is not a world of predation in the name of competition. Smith's world is very different. You must understand he wrote the theory of moral sentiments before he loathed, he wrote the wealth of nations which shows his priorities very clearly. Anyway, subject to this proviso, it is true that Smithian individual achieves collective interest, the public good by following his self interest. But here self interest defined very carefully in a self governed fashion. Now, if the individual works like this, where does the state come in? We must place Smith in the context of people who are looking at individual and state through social contract theories. We will look at him in the context of Locke. Hobbes and Rousseau, because Smithian idea of freedom sits somewhere in this terrain where these are the peaks of special theories. John Locke's idea of freedom is very clear, it is not meant to be sacrificed, it is not meant to be given up at any cost. People only give up some of their freedoms in order that the rest of the freedoms are conserved in order that the rest of the freedoms survive. The freedom of property is very central in Locke's system and therefore, Locke suggests that people forego certain other freedoms in order that the freedom of property is held. So, it is a partial freedom on which Locke's individual who makes the social contract to create the state and the society this individual keeps a constant eye. Am I giving up too much in the hands of the state, then it will go into tyranny. Is my sanction of freedoms into the hands of the state just adequate to look after my property? In other words, the state is under constant scrutiny in the lock system, because loss of freedom per se in the lock system is not comfortable. Now, in, in the Hobbesian system, loss of freedom is total. You studied Hobbes, have not you? We have talked about Hobbes too earlier. In the Hobbesian system, the state of nature is predatory, anarchic. No human being is safe and secure in the state of nature, because self-centeredness is also lawless self-centeredness anything may happen, nothing is secure. So, Hobbes says surrender everything in the hands of a superman, a superpower and having surrendered this feel secure. So, this was the other extreme from Locke. Somewhere along the course Rousseau has a different path, I would not call it a middle path, but In the Rousseauian system, 
freedoms are surrendered through social contract in order that other freedoms come in. Freedoms of the state of nature are surrendered so that freedoms of the civil society are acquired by the individual. So, once again there is a partial freedom and civil society also keeps a constant lookout to whether the state is transgressing its limits in Rousseauian system. I remember telling you sometime that wittingly or unwittingly almost all leaders of the French revolution owed something to Rousseau. He inspired them in different ways. Many of them in fact gave a revolutionary fervor to Rousseau which he himself did not have. See he became a symbol of the very revolution in France long after his time and without being aware of the consequences of his actions in the history of France. Anyway, so we see these are the three positions in terms of freedoms. Where does Adam Smith come in in this? Adam Smith comes in in a very pragmatic way. In a sense Locke, Hobbes and Rousseau all three are idealists. They are looking at an ideal situation, an ideal definition of freedom, an ideal definition of social contract, an ideal definition of surrender of freedom and then supervision of the state. Adam Smith is very pragmatic. He says the economy consisting of a number of people who have their own interests in mind, who are subject to moral sentiment also has a natural tendency for the betterment of the public interest automatically. The invisible hand ensures that. So, the question of loss of freedom is not an issue of ideals for Smith. The loss of freedom in the system is only a regulation of one's own freedom, which is why I said long before Smith's state comes into consideration, it is a observer in Smith who becomes more important, because whatever the laws which state constitutes, whatever statutes the states bring in, whatever the regulatory authorities the state bring into existence, they are all creations of this observer in the individual. In other words, some this invisible monitor, this invisible umpire within the person. So, the state is not an outsider. In all, in all these three, in Rousseau, Locke and Hobbes, there is a clear dichotomy in language. On the one hand, there is the individual with his or her freedoms. On the other hand, there is this thing which takes your freedoms away called state. So, the whole question is how do you define this thing which is outside of you and how much can you give that thing to protect yourself. So, it is the individual and the state which is essentially an exogenous thing. Am I not right? In Smith system the state is endogenous, it is not exogenous. If you want you can write this down. Okay. As I said, the need for regulating human conduct comes not when the impartial observer is nice, observer is nice and strong within the human beings, then they regulate themselves. But there are times when the impartial observer is weakened the power of the, by the power of ego or the by the lust for power or for uh, getting quick benefits without much work, any of the other drives which is negative in the human being. For example, the formation of a cartel in business 
what is a cartel? It did not exist in the time of Smith, but we know cartels today. Right, okay. Say oligopoly. Right. Now, an oligopoly consists of certain number of firms which are not competitive, but which are not cooperative either, but with specific purpose in mind they collude with each other. Now, this oligopoly might end up fixing prices or regulating supplies in such a manner that prices get fixed. Can you think of the biggest oligopoly in the last 40 years which changed virtually the fate of this world? OPEC. OPEC. Fantastic. My God, what did you have for lunch? Very nice. Tell me what OPEC did. OPEC, uh, they regulate the production of oil so that the prices they want to, if they want to increase the risk, especially in the 1970s. They it's an organization of petroleum exporting countries. They got together, formed the organization and simply announced to the world, we are not going to increase the supply of petrol for so many days, so many weeks. It is going to be stopped at this point. It, it was a unilateral decision, a unilateral declaration. And then what happened? Petrol prices shot up three times, four times within a month, matter of two, three months. Now, this was not in public interest. It was not in the interest of anybody in the world. It was not in the interest of oil processing companies. It was not in the interest of oil using customers across the world. But it was in their interest to do this because they hiked up their earnings. So, this is one good example of what Smith meant when he said you might indulge in a non-competitive and non-cooperative behavior which might go against public interest. Hmm? Then you might form organizations, associations, groups which might further your power in the system, but which might go against the public interest in the system too. The best examples that you can think of of this today are in India caste organizations, right? What is a caste organization? What is a caste? Sharanya. Is a caste, caste organization? Uh, we are talking about the caste system. Can Indeed. Oh, okay. Uh, it is basically um, an organization that is based on um, a social hierarchy based on purity and pollution. Mm. So, uh, the people at the higher, uh, at the top of the system are considered purer than those at the bottom of the system and have greater privileges and it is basically, uh, it advocates endogamy and uh, Fantastic. not mixed. Dynamic. Did you have a course on sociology in this thing, in this program? My God, you are talking of endogamy. You are talking Oh boy, you are well informed, aren't you? So, what's can you think of why caste organizations could be behaving in this Mithian fashion today? Can you name something that happened in the last couple of years? A particular caste organization which built up enormous power? Yes. Say it. Yes, the Gujars in the north. Gujars are traditionally a very powerful caste group centered on Haryana, Rajasthan and western, Raja, west, western UP. Essentially, they come from a background of cattle maintenance, cow herds. They belong to the Yadava background, but they do not identify with the rest of Yadavas. They think they are different. They think they are they are an independent aristocracy because you had a Gujar kingdom very powerfully in the in the border between Rajasthan, Delhi, Haryana. In that little triangle, you had a very powerful Gujar political influence right through the Mughal period and after. Whatever reason, they have reasons to believe that they are very special people and they are being neglected in the system. And what did they do? They got together, organized massive protests, public, which are some, some were 
parliamentary, some were non parliamentary <coughs> protests. Hmm? Eventually, what happened? They got the government to get into a dialogue about what should be done to the Gujars. So, eventually, this is the kind of behavior which Smith had in mind when he said, your self interest might lead to your creation of groups or organizations or associations which improve your power over the state and help you influence the state in your favor. This is a situation where the impartial observer has become weak. And then either individuals or groups trying to influence the state to make decisions on their behalf might indulge in straightforward graft, bribery, corruption. Smith points out to these occasions and is contemptuous towards them, but the fact remains that he sees these situations as one when the impartial observer is weak. So, all these three are occasions when the state becomes an active player within the system. You cannot say the state is outside. If an MLA from Gujars is lobbying in the legislature for the Gujars, you cannot say that the Gujars and, uh, and the state are mutually exclusive. Am I not right? So, it is for this reason that in the Smithian system, we must understand that the state and, and all its instruments are endogenous. They are all part of the system. They are the political phase of the economic system. So, there is a social phase, there is a political phase F A C E E and an economic phase, none exclusive to the other. Hmm? So, the entire system is very what should I say open ended, it is non exclusive and everything has a play and anything in politics has a play in economics, anything in economics has a play in society and so on and so forth. You can see that Smith's mind is very catholic, it is wide open to thinking in multiple directions, but what is important here is that that state is endogenous. makes a big difference. I will introduce you to a little bit of modern theory of regulation which started since 1960 to show how it simply echoed this particular angle of Smith's writings. It is said that Smith is the founding father of modern economics. In more senses than one, modern economics is inspired by a lot that Smith wrote including newer theories, newer ways of looking at the economic system and so forth. In the 1960s, a very interesting direction of thought opened out in the west. Of course, it had its own fallouts in India. People were looking at economic regulation. In other words, the government regulates the economic activity in the system through its capacity to make laws, to make statutes and in other ways to guide and push the economy in preferred directions. And in all this, the conventional thinking was in a dichotomous state just as we have discussed earlier about how Locke and Rousseau and Hobbes themselves thought in a dichotomous fashion about the state and the individual. Conventional wisdom up to the 1960s, whenever they talked of the state within the economic theoretical framework, it always assumed that the state is exogenous, market is something else. Market and state never, never mixed, they were like oil and water. So, when people talked of state, they thought of communism. When they, when they thought of market, they talked of freedom and democracy. So, you can see the whole languages associated with the state, whole languages associated with the market up to the 60s. In the 60s, there was a whole genre of writing which was started 
I think initially by a paper by George Stigler of Chicago on the theory of regulation where he almost echoes what Smith has been saying in 1776. Stigler says the state consists of what? Some senators, some legislators and government officials, other such functionaries and so forth. And what does the state do? It forms laws and it enforces the laws. And who are the people who get into the state? The people of the society. They get elected, they get in there and do what the state must do. So who are these people again? They are also people who are part of the economic system with different economic vested interests, access to grind, no. So Stigler says there are diverse economic, economic interests and groups in the society which try to influence the decision making process in the legislature, in the executive and so forth in such a manner that laws are framed or formed or laws are revoked or repealed as and how specific interest groups benefit out of it. So, Stigler actually started a theory of interest groups and a theory which explained why the state did what it did in the name of regulation, right. Subsequently, a lot of people wrote about this are well into the mid 90s, 1990s. They were thinking in terms of the state as fully endogenous, the state as, the state as partially autonomous, the state as slightly autonomous or more autonomous as the case may be, but they never thought of the state as being exogenous to the system. Do you understand the profundity of this theory? Do you want me to repeat it? Please say so if I had to. Right, which part do I have to repeat? You see, shall I start with George Stigler? See, up to the time of Stigler, People always thought when I say up to the time of Stigler after the second world war and up to the 1960s. When people thought of the market, they thought of market, democracy, freedoms and all that sort of stuff. When they start thought of the state, they said okay, regulation, restriction, limiting the activities of the market, controlling the market, nationalizing property, in short everything that was anti-market, anti-democracy, anti-freedom. So, model of the state was communism. The model of uh, uh, the market was democracy, right. So, this was the way of thinking, two different languages. So, state was exclusive, market was exclusive, right. And the whole question of big debates among economists was, if you strengthen the hands of the state, you are weakening the hands of the market and therefore, you are working against the market. So, state and market had not only exclusive interests, but they are mutually detrimental interests. This was the, the way they thought and this was how economic regulation was thought of. So, whoever thought of regulating the economy was immediately told that he was trying to constrain the market, he was trying to restrict the market, he was trying to limit the market, in short he was trying to destroy the market. It is in this milieu that George Stigler wrote this theory of interest groups in his theory of regulation. He said, well look who is doing all this regulation? a bunch of senators, a bunch, a bunch of executives in the state and how do they take decisions? Do they hold a census each time they want to they make a decision on the law? No, they listen to people who have interests in this matter. They want to do something about steel industry, they talk to the steel industry people. They want to do something about cement industry, they talk to the cement industry people. Each industry has its own lobbyists, right. They have their own spokesmen, they have their own organizations. In other words, each is an interest group. So, the economy not only consists of players in the market, but the economy also consists of people who are also constituents of different interest groups. And these interest groups have as their main function to constantly look at what the state is doing, what kind of laws it is enacting, what kinds of laws it is repealing, what kinds of statutes it is bringing so that they will constantly keep looking at the state to see if it is interfering in their turf. And secondly making sure 
that their turf is better looked after by the state than other turfs. So, there are a series of competing interest groups across the nation who are trying to turn the regulatory power of the state to their advantage. Am I not right? This is the theory of regulation and see what Smith has said in 1776. He is saying the same thing. People can get together to form associations, organizations, etcetera to enhance their power over the state. Well, that is what Sigler was saying. And then what do they do? They use these organizations, associations, etcetera, etcetera, in, in a number of ways by hook or crook to maneuver the state to do things which suit their group and therefore to, to, to suit their members. It might be graft, it might be uh, bribery, it might be open lobbying in the parliament, anything, but they have got to get their way. So, this is the political process in the system, this is the way the state works which is exactly the way George Stigler was describing his theory of interest groups and regulation. I am just trying to show what people mean when they say that Smith is the founding father of economics. All branches of the subject, there are all kinds of areas which have been influenced by what Smith wrote. Very often without being aware of it, George Stigler probably had not read these bits of Smith before he wrote his paper. He wrote them through independent uh, awareness, independent uh, empirical observations, independent deductive reasoning by watching America around him. But look, eventually he ended up saying something which had Smith had said in 1776. Right? This is just an aside to show you how something modern also dates back to the past. Now, Smith had a close relationship with labor in his mind because his one criticism of the physiocrats was very much like Galliani. You remember Galliani said, who says only agriculture generates surplus? Wherever people are smart and efficient, they can generate surplus. Is not that what, uh, what he said? Which is why he said, manufacturing can generate surplus too because it is the laborer, the worker who works there, who is the source, his skill is the source of surplus. So, Smith goes on parallel lines, he agrees with Galliani there. He thinks physiocrats are great because they are talking of surplus in the system for the first time. That a system should generate surplus, which should benefit the whole system and enable its growth. It is a great idea, but he says look, not land, land is limited. He agrees with the Galliani when he says, look, land is subject to uh, vagaries of nature, rain, sleet, might kill a crop or you might not have enough land to grow the crops that you need. Whereas, if you depend upon labor and its productive skill, there is no end to the surplus that you can generate in the system wherever labor works. So, it is just a question of wrong mindset according to him the physiocrats focused on land and restricted themselves whereas he looked at labor which after all also worked land then completely the picture changed so labor was at the heart of the whole productive process and labor was the root of economic value in smithian economics surplus comes from labor. How? Because division of labor increases productivity, specialization which increases more productivity. So, the source of surplus is labor which is going through the continuous process of division of labor and specialization. No? And labor is also able to generate surplus because it gets way below what it produces. A laborer might work for 15 hours a day, but if you look at how many hours it costs for him to earn enough to eat that day, it will probably be 2 hours or 3 hours. So, there is the surplus. In Smithian system, part of the surplus went to the capitalist, 
part of the system part of the surplus went to the landlords through rent and Smith says the landlords are not great guys for the growth of the system because they get their money and spend it and have a great time whereas the capitalists oriented towards profits and gains when they get their money they are thrifty they save it they accumulate more capital so he sees growth as a process which involves the thrift thrifty accumulative behavior of the capitalist on the one hand and the ability of labor to produce surplus on the other a combination of these two he sees is the secret of economic growth tremendous no so what is a static model in the physiocrats becomes a very dynamic moving flowing growing model in smith that is probably the genius of smith and then does it mean that smith advocates the government strongly fixing subsistence wage to workers so that they can't earn more and the system can grow that's what the mercantilist did smith says no the economy has a natural tendency for wages to be moving along subsistence wages now smith's followers ricardo and others they said it happened because of the demography population growth of population keeps wages at subsistence level smith says nothing he says it's political economy once again he says the employers the capitalists they try to push terms towards their favor they try to form collusions among themselves so that they can fix the maximum wages that they'll give to the workers and nothing about that they try to influence the governments to prevent the workers from forming unions it used to be called combinations in those days this business of workers forming unions was called making combinations so there were lots of times when there were movements against combination of workers they were all at the initiative of the capitalists so on the one hand there was a political force of capitalists on the other hand there was a political force of the workers who were trying to combine form unions and to struggle make sure that they got some minimum wage above the subsistence level so this was a potentially political situation potentially conflict ridden situation and smith was very conscious of it he was not saying the invisible hand is going to save you here the interests were in conflict so he says in the long run what happens each is trying to influence and manipulate and maneuver the state which is endogenous eventually he says in the long run wages tend towards subsistence wage because of two reasons one the power of survival of the capitalist when they are face to face pitted against each other capitalist has better power of survival simply the worker cannot starve for so many days if he goes on strike capitalist can simply survive closing the factory for months second the capitalist economic strength in lobbying and creating influence in the state is far higher than that of the worker and therefore in the long run the wages will tend towards subsistence wage and this is normal according to smith again you, i i think this is incredible genius because as we as we shall find out after the break in this bit of smith lay the whole of socialist economics including marx but that will be after the break do you have any questions at this point yes mentioned that rousseau's you know rousseau's theory was on uh, limiting the power of the individual to limiting the liberty so that the, the liberties of the civil society might come in like is, is civil society understood in the same way as we understand it now it's a lovely question it's a lovely question do you have a question to add to that no no i, I just wanted to like add uh 
which is a collection of all the people which is the general will should always be the same as every individual's will too so if an individual doesn't follow the general will that means he should be forced to be free and follow the general will because this general will is uh, in the best interest of the individual too my question is no his question is slightly no but then the civil society there is basically the general will and that's what my answer was saying it's it's today in today's sense civil society is uh, a sphere which is outside that of the state and uh, market market yeah but back then uh, he wasn't thinking in terms of these uh, divisions of state market and uh, civil society he was think his theory uh, of social contract was referring to a general will as a i don't know if it was a civil society but that was the general will. I think may I contribute a little bit there. You see, you are right, uh, and you are right too. The two words mean different things. I think about the time when Rousseau was writing, 18th century, the Italians had a better conception of civil society. They were thinking in terms of uh, they're more they had a much clearer concept rather than better of uh, civil society. They thought, for instance, economics is civil economics. so they had an idea of civil as relating to the public and therefore economics became a civil economy because it related to the public sphere and the government was part of that public sphere the market was part of the public sphere they used the word civil as russians towards the end of the 19th century used the word people towards the end of 19th century there was a big group in russia called the narodniks who were talking about the people all the time you see the people which included the government which you know so the italians and the french in the second half or the first half or the middle of 18th century we are talking of civil in this sense today civil society has acquired a very distinctive meaning as you are pointing out it means something that is not government which is trying to regulate the economy not market which puts a profit and price on everything but which is working on the basis of moral imperatives today civil society has a very limited perspective because you as a civil society member as an ngo you can neither make profit nor can you tell others what to do you're in a limbo is that clear yeah. 